Hey there, my name is Shane Craddock, and this is the Inner Edge podcast, where I share a different take on how to lead and live a sustainable, high-performance life. Over the course of different episodes, I'm going to challenge the belief that tension, stress, and struggle are essential to success and creativity. My experience is that there's an easier way, there's a better way, and indeed, there's an essential way that we need to explore for the times that we live in. So let's go ahead, let's jump in and explore. Hello there, and welcome to uh, a special edition, I guess, of the Inner Edge podcast. Um, this year, I have interviewed a couple of people, one being Helen Erlen, uh, second was Joseph Jaworski in a leadership context, and today I'm going to share with you a conversation that I had recently with a very interesting person, a guy called Richard Hogan. Uh, Richard is, I suppose, from my point of view, an expert on dealing with adolescence. So he's a He's a systemically trained family, family psychotherapist. He'll explain in the interview what that actually means. Um, he has his own business in Dublin, his own uh, therapy clinic. He um, he writes every week for uh, one of the leading Irish uh, nationals, the Irish Examiner. And he's also the author of a best-selling book, Parenting the Screenager. Now, from my own point of view, as a father to two teenagers, Jen and Sam, I suppose I had my own interest in reading Richard's book, first of all. And then I thought, you know, what, this is a good guy to have on the inner edge because a lot of what we're trying to do, I think, in life as parents uh, and adults, obviously, is very much on the inner side. But then when it comes to a teenager and your kids, um, the same kind of rules or approach definitely don't always work. Uh, <laughs> certainly, I know from my own experience of dealing with adults that the approach that I would take with adults is very different to I suppose what I would take with with teens, and then you know teens is is one thing, but then your own kids, whole different ball game. So um, Richard is, is, as I say, is the clinical director as well of um, an award winning psychotherapy and counselling service called Therapy Institute, which is based in Dublin. He's uh, quite an accomplished speaker. He's also somebody who contributes to the media, and he's been pretty much on everything. Uh, of significance in the Irish media and he also went to the US to do what's called a Fulbright scholarship uh, which he'll talk about a little bit in the interview so I'm going to get straight into that with uh, Richard and then at the end of the conversation I'll come back to you here and uh, just share with you some of the things that stood out for me let's get into it okay Richard listen thanks for making the time to come on the podcast really appreciate it Great to be on, Shane. Thanks for having me. Um, well, look, I, I think probably the simplest thing to do is probably ask a question to kind of introduce you, you to explain what you do. So in your words, what is the work you do and, and who do you do the work with? Well, I'm a systemically trained uh, systems consultant, basically. So I, I work, I have a clinic in, in Fitzwilliam Street called Therapy Institute, and I work with, all, you know, all, a lot of different issues. But I suppose over the years, because of my background in education, I worked a lot. I worked for 20 years with teenagers in schools and that, and I've lectured in universities and that. I wrote a book called Parenting the Screenager, which um, I wrote in response to what I was seeing in my clinic. And I was seeing a lot of uh, families coming in because I'm a family system, a trained family psychotherapist. So I work a lot with families. And that was the big issue that I saw in the last number of years impacting on the family. And so I wrote a book about how to manage a teenager in this technological tech savvy kid, you know, and that really that really, there was a massive response to that. So over the last number of years, I suppose I've specialized a lot in adolescence. Um, it's somewhere I feel kind of really at home uh, working with adolescents. Um, and I'm just I'm just finishing a book at the moment called The Home is Where the Start is about the family and the impact that the family has on our development and how it shapes our ideas about who we are, about that inner narrative, about that, that idea of the story you tell yourself that comes through your early attachment, through your personality traits, through the, you know, the position you came in the family, through the labels that you heard from the family and from the school system. And so the book is really about how to unpack all of that stuff and learn to thrive again, because the gift of life, you know, the miracle of life can become very tainted very quickly by all these heavy, dense narratives that we get t- told about who we are and they become self-fulfilling prophecies and we limit ourselves under them and they become quite destructive. And so the book is all about how to kind of almost reauthor your life again and how to find who you are. And l- looking then at, of course, 47.2, the most unhappy year that we have as adults and, uh, and understanding why that is. And so the work I do is, 
I work with all aspects really of, of you know issues that are facing society. I write about it every Thursday. I've got a I've got a column with the Irish Examiner where I call learning points where I talk about all the things that I'm seeing in my clinic. Um, and also not just my clinic, I talk about a lot of things that I just I see in every day in my own family and in other families. And I, I talk about issues that are coming up for all of us as human beings, you know, in Ireland and abroad. Um so that's kind of the stuff that I'm kind of looking at currently okay. well you, you've, you've just now gone into loads of different things I've probably got five yeah. extra questions <laughs> I have planned to ask you <laughs> um, well first of all I've read Parenting the Screen Age you have it here oh yeah very good very accessible yeah I compliment you on it it's 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 short and to the point yeah it I, is yeah and it's meant to be a, a very practical guide very practical yeah very practical so it's kind of it's, I'd highly recommend it to anybody listening to this and I'm looking forward to you said the home is where the start the is the home is where the start is yeah it's, that's not no this is a much more adventurous book this is much more complicated and much sure. more driven by neuroscience and, and psychology and, okay. and all those kind of things stuff that I'm interested in myself you know and in 2020, I went to America on a Fulbright scholarship looking at all the stuff that I'm talking about in the book, about how we come to tell ourselves the story of who we are and looking at ideas around prejudice and the internalized prejudice that we hold. And, and so I'm just I'm really fascinated by all that kind of stuff. And the story, actually, what actually came out of the book, Shane, is that uh, I, I hadn't planned to do it, but a lot of my own story came out as I was writing. Is this I was, yeah, I was telling my own story about my own family, where I came in the family and what was going on in my family and how that's, you know, impacted my story as I started off in my life, my young adult life. And as I was sending into the editors, they were like, that stuff you were talking about your family, can you do more of that? Because that's where the writing really, you know, hits a kind of a level that's just great. So I kept, I, I just, I got into it and became almost autobiographical in ways. And so I'm telling the story about how do we improve ourselves, but I'm also looking at my own story and how I came to be who I am today. Okay, very interesting. So I can relate to that because I'm in the, in the middle of writing a book myself, right? Good stuff. But what I wanted to ask you on that then is, you know, I've got loads of questions, probably 60 questions I could ask you here, right? But what's coming to mind now is from that second book, you know, the ways you're writing, especially if you're writing a poor personal aspect yeah. of yourself, it pushes you into this reflective mode. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what were the little nuggets? Could you give me one nugget to come out of that for you in relation to what you do? Oh, just, see, I, I kind of see, you know yourself, I, I don't know if you did any background in psychology or psychotherapy, but I did a four-year master's with UCD in the Matter Hospital, which was quite intensive. And so I learned lots of nuggets about myself, you know, in those four years. And um, writing the book, I was aware of a lot, you know, when you're working psych clinically, I have a supervisor and you're always working at things like isomorphism, all the things that are coming up for you in the therapy session. So you're always, as a psychotherapist, you're very aware about yourself in a conversation and what's coming up in the conversation. Um, so I was aware, of, well, there was, a, there was a few kind of aspects of it, I suppose. Um, my father, you know, he was a journalist for the Irish Times, great think, good mind, you know, and all that, suffered with addiction, you know, and alcoholism. And for a long time, I saw him very in a very gray and white adolescent kind of way of like, you know, bad guy kind of, but I suppose writing the book was like a cathartic experience uh, and uh, coming to terms with that relationship. And uh, coming to terms with, you know, our relationship going forward, He's, he was quite sick there. As I was writing the book, he he nearly died. And, uh, so, you know, and so I went down to see him in Cork. And all of that stuff, I suppose there was, um, you know, the, I suppose what, what I got out of that book was that I, I, no, I, I no longer have any negative feelings towards that earlier childhood experience. In okay. fact, it, it be kind of became a bit of power in my life. It really helped me clinically working with adolescents and working with addiction and working with children who feel. And I suppose that's why I got into psychotherapy in the first place. I was always in the classroom, let's say, helping people who felt voiceless or felt um, somehow this is, this is as a teacher, as a teacher. Yeah, I was always working with and parents would say to me, God, you know, that was great. You really helped. So the academics is one part of it for me. But I, I understood I always understood very early on to help a kid achieve something or attain something academically. They needed to think about themselves fully, you know what I mean? And you, we only have them for a certain amount of time in school. But if you if you give them the right thinking, the right paradigms to, to kind of start thinking about themselves, you can you know, they can start to thrive. OK, well, so you're hitting on an area that's obviously, I would say, if anybody's listening to this who's a parent, they'd be thinking, oh, well, I want to hear more about that. Yeah. What I'm wondering is, go back to your, your clinic at the moment. Um, the people who come up in your clinic, are, are they mostly, is it parents primarily or is it mostly teens or is it a balance between the two? It would be a balance between the two. I would work with couples as well. Um, I try to limit the amount of couple work I do. I would have a lot of requests for couple work, but I, I, it's just it's so it's such um, complicated and requires a lot of work. So I, I try to limit down that the amount of couples that I might see in any given month. But mainly, it would be um, adolescents and adults. 
Okay, so so adolescents and adults. So you're dealing with, I'm, I'm guessing, a wide multitude of problems. Yeah, absolutely. But, but what would you think are the biggest, what are the most common problems? Common problems I would see, say, currently with adolescents would be anxiety. But that would be the huge thing. And I suppose I, I, I would... You know, I, I write a lot about it and I've got some ideas around it and I've been studying it and reading about it and, you know, writing papers on it. And I carried out study myself, research on anxiety and resilience about three or four years ago before I stepped before the pandemic, before I wrote that book, Parenting the Screenager. I went out into about 25 schools around Ireland. And I spoke to students and I interviewed them for a bit of research there. And, you know, uh, and anxiety is we're in the age of anxiety. There's no doubt about it. We're in the age of anxiety. And of course, the pandemic was like pouring fuel in an already, you know, very, very well lit bonfire. And uh, so that's the main thing. And not so much years ago, it would have been sexuality and identity. Um, I see a little bit of that now, but uh, not not in the same degree and not not with the same kind of discourse behind it, that internalized prejudice, not so much. Uh, with couples, I would see very much working, uh, you know, pornography and technology would be a mass problem there. And with individuals, self-limiting beliefs and family of origin and all of that kind of destructive stuff not not thriving in life understanding the miracle of life but not, not understanding you know what that is or how to really experience it or how to thrive and happiness is a huge thing that i talk about a lot and write about a lot i do lots of interviews around because i've got certain ideas around what happiness is and i suppose the, the anxiety and happiness would be you know it's funny because i did an interview with brendan o'connor show there last saturday and in the morning, I was interviewed by Ireland AM. I talked about anxiety, and in on the Brendan O'Connor show, they were interviewed about happiness. And I was thinking, well, there's a great, there's a great, you know, <laughs> a microcosm of what's going on around the world, you know, in our, in our country in particular. It's like because in the morning I was talking about anxiety, and then in the afternoon I was talking about how to thrive and have happiness in your life. <laughs> and that they're the two things I think that are coming up for yeah, people. Yeah. Well, it's, if you don't mind, let's stay with anxiety for a second. Sure. Yeah. Because I mean, it does seem to be, uh, it does seem to be hugely on the increase. Oh, well, uh, it is massively, yeah. And you called it the age of anxiety. So yeah. step, I'm not going to ask you about how to treat that because I'm sure it's multi-pronged, but I'll come back to that in a minute. But what's the cause of it? Well, as I've analyzed it, anxiety is the is like, you know, the fear of an unknown future event, right? And underneath that is a paradigm. This is what I've experienced in my clinic for many years and written about. Underneath that's a paradigm that they don't have the competency to meet that unknown future event, right? And so, you know, the warning system, the Olympic system, the amygdala, all that stuff, the warnings, the fire alarm, let's say, fires because you you believe you don't have the skills to meet whatever that unknown future event is, right? And that can be a very profound experience when there's not an immediate threat in front of you, there's not some negative stimuli in front of you, but your warning system is firing, and so your blood pressure is raised, your palpitations, your breathing, and all that kind of stuff is happening. And so that's kind of like what anxiety is, right? It's a fear of a kind of an unknown future event. And what actually happens to a lot of people who have disrupted in their childhood, or where I would see a big thing, a lot of things happening is, parents in all of their well intention have removed obstacles for their child and so obstacles are like immunizing your child and so when you remove the obstacles um, and I meet this I've, I've I've met this story so much Shane in my clinic the same story about a kid who's really overwhelmed and can't go to school or can't go into the into work or something has happened to, to, to disrupt them all of a sudden and we go back and we track it and we look at their genogram and I hear the same story about never having to manage anything in my life it was always removed from me and that's like not about blaming parents because it's a fundamental basic instinct to protect your chil children. And it's like, okay, how do your kids get resilient, you know, and how do they get strong and how do they manage themselves? And the analogy I always use for parents when I'm sitting down with them in the, in the clinic and I can see them kind of going, I don't know, do I believe him with this one? I don't, I don't mm. think it's good to leave them with trouble, you know, or problems. And I'd say, well, how did you teach your child to cross the road? Did you go down to the zebra crossing and tell them, don't worry about the cars because you'll always be there to hold their hand? <laughs> They're like, well, no. I said, but of course you didn't, because if you did that, they'd be annihilated when they went down there because they'd make a poor decision. Yeah. And I said, anxiety is the same thing. If you remove the obstacles from your child, the cars, the adversity, they when the car comes, they get wiped out by it because they won't know how to manage it. And so you need to listen to your kids when they come to you with, with stressful situations or they're getting bullied or someone is re rejecting them or, you know, they're feeling whatever it is that they're feeling. You have to, re you, have to re you have to be careful with your impulse there to just jump in and solve and problem solve because when you do that, you diminish the gift of your parenting and you you become the hero in your kid's eyes. I mean, it's great for you to be the person to solve the problems, but it really sets them up for failure going forward. So there's a, I, and I think there's a huge 
I, I think it's such a complicated thing. I mean, I, I think about this and write about it all the time. I think the fact that we're having less kids means that we're more invested. We have more money and we're, we've got more time. We're more invested in our kids. And so when I was a kid down in Cork, I'd say, see you, mom. And I'd be gone out the door and I wouldn't come back till I was hungry. You know, and that was a different kind of childhood. And you managed yourself and you 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 leaned on yourself a lot more and you knew that you needed resources to survive your time growing up and all that. And I think because of what's happening and also the the guilt that moms might feel because of and moms in particular, because their mothers weren't working. And, you know, it takes two people to buy a house now, pretty much, let's be honest. And so you need two more. You need two wages coming in to buy that house. And that puts a lot of pressures on moms in particular, because they feel guilty that they're not home like their parents were. Their mother generally would have been home to mind the kids. And so that guilt seeps into how they parent. And they uh, in the book there in Parenting the Screen Nature, I was saying, don't parent from a position of guilt just because it's changed. The dynamic has changed and you have to go out and work. You have to keep your parental authority. You have to say no to your children. And when they ask for things, you know, you have to be able to manage that so that you're not giving them, giving them, giving them, giving them, because then they develop a, an unrealistic expectation. And there, all that stuff there is that the seeds and the germs of anxiety of course then on top of it of course then there's a genetic component to it too of course sure, sure. and then we have to we have to ask parents we have to say what i always say to parents what does your child see when you're anxious when you're looking for the keys and you're going out the door what are you what are they seeing what are you templating for them and how, so important, we have to, how important is that oh massive that is hugely significant so that's the role modeling of role modeling i mean that's modeling modeling is such an important part for that's the template you know, when, you're, when I'm talking to teenagers and I say to them, uh, what's it like growing up in your parents' relationship? I can see a <laughs> smile on their face, you know, and they're, 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 ready, they're ready to go and tell me, well, I'll tell you, Richard, you know, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you about these two now. And they get into it, you know, but... Um, and- Just pause for a second, so go back a step. So in your book, because uh, again, like there's a couple of things that really stuck out to me. One of the ones is the phrase, it's a lovely phrase, it says a lot in it, but I think it links to what you're talking about. You said... Be at their side, yeah. but not on, but not yeah. on. Their be side. by their side, and not, not yeah. Be by their side, not on it. So is yeah. that 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 links into that. Into that, that is absolutely what that's it. That's that is exactly what I'm talking about in one little terse sentence. Be by their side. When you're by their side, you're listening to them. You're not you're not solving. You're not screaming at the ref for not playing your child. When you're by their side, you're listening to their experience. You're validating their experience, their experience, but you're not trying to solve the problem for them. You're listening to them. You're asking them questions about what they're experiencing. When you're on their side, you're you know your kid comes to you and says someone says something in the yard. You're you're you become oh my god who said what and you're going out to the school and you're giving out to this teacher because this you're on their side. You're down at their level and you're on their side and you're implicitly telling them that you think they don't have the skills to manage it what do you want your kid to be able to do solve the problem for themselves or always feel that you are the person who will that they have to come to now that's what i see with anxiety a lot and right. like kids not being able to sleep at night you know and parents said to me she's been sleeping with herself for six months i'm going oh my god you know you, you've you've entrenched the behavior here now and you have to be very careful because you're caught in a positive feedback loop a positive feedback loop is the thing the child uses to make themselves feel better is the thing that spirals their life out of control. You have a 14 year old daughter sleeping in with the parents. You know, that's that's a solution to a problem of feeling anxious about going to sleep, but it's spiraling their lives out of control because they know this is not, you know, healthy and this is not what a 14 year old girl should be doing. And, you know, and so you're, 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 you have to be very careful of how you react and your interactions with your kids when they come to you with issues. So that phrase helicopter parenting, is that kind of what you're talking about there? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't I never like I never cared for that phrase to be honest. But yeah, that's I mean, it's um see, I I think it comes from such a good position. It's from parents who who really care, and also it comes from a position of parents who want to ameliorate some of the stuff that came up for them. And so let's just say in the 70s and 80s, when we were growing up, we mightn't have had our feelings validated. And this is what I call the paradox of parenting. You know, we mightn't have had our feelings validated, and so we decide when we're gonna have kids, I'm gonna I'm gonna resolve that issue that I had and I'm gonna fix that problem, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna validate my kids and what you do there is you end up your kid feels absolutely nothing because you've over you've over parented them you give them too much and you over validate their feelings so that it's it's kind of like valueless to them and so they don't they don't feel it and that's a profound something that's a profound sentiment for a, a parent to hear in the clinic that the child says you say that to me all the time it kind of has no meaning and the very thing the child was trying to the parent was trying to fix is the very thing the child is experiencing once again in in their lives in the family life i, I remember talking to this um expert dog trainer right it's gonna be this is, this is probably gonna be a poor analogy now richard so forgive me but expert dog trainer and remember they said to me they said you know shame what i do is uh, uh like the, the the people hire me to train the dog and i come in and i go i, I just rub the dog and play with the dog and i say to them i'm not here to train the dog i'm here to train you 
<laughs> and what I'm wondering is, I'm listening to you, is a large part of it, say, if you're trying to help a teen, is it about also helping the adults to work on themselves? Absolutely. I know it is. It is absolutely. And parents, I suppose, when they come into the clinic, often, you know, they've often expect the conversation. I'd say, no, I don't meet the child first ever. You know, I never meet the teenager first. I'd always say we're going to have a, a session or two, first of all. And sometimes that lasts long. It might even last three months before I see the child. Right. And um, so very quickly, often, you know, some of the real issues come out and especially around technology. But just in general, I mean, you know, and it's not about blame. It's about, you know, I'm a systems trained psychotherapist it's about figuring out what the dynamics that are going on in the family that has maintained the homeostasis, the balance of what's kind of going can you explain, on. Can you explain to somebody listening to this, what's the difference in your mind between a systems trained psychotherapist and an ordinary psychotherapist? Yeah. So psychodynamic or so a systems trained psychotherapist, this is the, this is the major difference. And I, I can give, can I, if I give you a quick analogy, yeah. Hamlet when we meet him at the start of the play is depressed, right? His dad has died. I don't know if you're aware of the play, but his dad is, his dad has died and his mom has remarried his uncle who he doesn't particularly care for. Now that's all we know at that particular time. And his mother is saying to him like, you know, what's wrong with you, Hamlet? And he says, I have that within which passage show the suits, the trappings and the suits of woe. He says, I'm depressed, mom, right? I'm, I am really sad. Right. And so if I'm a psychodynamic, I will analyze that. Or if I, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, I will medicate Hamlet. Right. But once we move into the soliloquy and we hear Hamlet speaking, we figure out very quickly that his depression isn't intrapsychic. It's not internally inside him. It's his environment is depressing. Hamlet isn't depressed. His environment is depressing. And that's the difference between a systems theorist. A systems psychotherapist will look at the, all, the, 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 all the myriad systems that you exist in and how they're impacting on you and how your interaction. We're all interconnected. Even this conversation, everything I say is is kind of is feeding back information to you, and and that's gonna that's gonna change what you say, and when you get that feedback, you're gonna change what I say when you speak, and so we're in this interconnected, uh, reciprocal process of communication, and we're all in that, and so to think of ourselves as isolated units, like a man is an island, you're you're on your own, is not, it's an error in how we think about human behavior and human connection, and the interpsychic world which is the internal world. None of us live there, you know, in solitude and isolation. That's that what's going on. There is our society, the, the, the discourse around us, how society is constructed, the rules around us. All of those things are imp- impacting even the language we speak. It's, it's all impacting in how we see the world and how we interpret it. So a systems theorist looks at the complexity of it all, whereas at times maybe a psychodynamic might just look at you as an individual and, and explore what's, you know, what your experience is and, you know, uh, looking at the individual and the interpsychic uh, you know causes. Okay, so then what I'd be right in saying then, if if uh, if a couple or a parent comes to you with a, a concern over a teenager, they'll present with a symptom, and then yeah. you're kind of more looking at the underlying. Well, what's the underlying environment and the different impacts here of the different people and the setup? That's what you're absolutely. Looking. And you're thinking you're thinking immediately from the training is that the symptom <sighs> can all, all, often be a product of the environment that it's yes. in. Right. Yeah. And so and that's a huge thing. And I and I and it just made so much sense to me. And it yeah. comes out of like, you know, Gregory Bates. And I mean, the theory behind it is fascinating and and cybernetics and all that. It's really it's yeah. really fascinating yeah. thinking. Yeah. Um, and it just as I was sitting there and the, this is what I did, actually, when, when I was sitting there in the lecture uh, over four years, I was thinking every teacher needs to know this. Yeah, they should. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I wrote a paper then called. Uh, how to merge systemic theory with educational pedagogy. And I sent it to Trinity and they wrote to me back and said, look, come on in for an interview. And they asked me to do a PhD with on that whole idea. And, yeah. And so that's where I'm kind of like writing a program around that at the moment about how to teach teachers, uh, how, to, how to think about the students in a systemic way, in an inclusive way. And that was all part of the Fulbright research that I did there a couple of years ago. Brilliant. Brilliant. Because obviously that that's very relevant to leaders as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Hundred percent. Yeah, and a family of sorts, very often dysfunctional. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I hundred percent. I mean, the, the family system is the most complicated route you're ever going to navigate. But uh, you know, your working environment is is a very close, uh, and we we experience our working life as a social experience. You know, experience. So it's very much a familial thing at times, and that's why it can feel the profound. It can be a profound hurt when you don't get a, you know, when you don't get a promotion, or you know, you get overlooked yeah. for something. So I, I had one kind of question that was, I'm calling it less of, more of, I think you've partially answered it. You know, I was, I was going to ask you, what do parents need to do less of, or maybe more of? What yeah. I'm, hearing, I'm hearing in relation to the obstacles is, I mean, sorry, and this is me paraphrasing back to you. It sounds to me the way you look at it is, which I would agree with myself, is 
uh, the obstacle, the pain of the obstacle is what allows the child to develop the resilience. Absolutely. By, take, by taking away that pain, you're taking away their chance that life has given them to develop, to evolve. Yeah, uh, well, when they experience the pain, it resolves itself anyway. And so they realize that they can manage it. And so think about that as a paradigm in your child's brain. Do you want them to think that I have the power to solve things? And like all adversity is like a shot of, Im- you know, immunized. It's like the vaccine, you know, a little bit of adversity is like a little bit of the uh, of the of the virus. And so every time you get a little bit of adversity and you manage it, you're building up your immunity to it later on down the road. And it's really important that we do that with our kids, that we allow them to experience it. Of course, we're going to be there and support them and Listen, I'm not saying for a second we return to austere parenting where we kind of say, be quiet and just suck it up. But my my point is like, ask them questions rather than jump to solve it. Ask them questions. What do you think you're doing in this situation that is impacting the situation negatively? What do you think you could be doing a little bit different, differently? What is it particularly about that person that, um, you know, is bringing is, is making you feel this? And uh, and there's a question I say to teenagers all the time. I think it's a really important one, especially in relation to like girls and Instagram and all that kind of stuff and boys as well being bullied. Why do you believe them? Why do you believe them? Yeah. What Why do you believe answers, them? What kind of answers do you get back with that one? It's a profound silence for a moment when they realize, yeah, it doesn't hurt if I don't believe them, actually. You know, it doesn't actually yeah, hurt if I don't believe they're them. They're starting to realize I have a choice. Yeah, I've got a choice here to actually believe them. Or not believe them. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a quick funny story. There, I do this. I have three daughters myself, and um, I did uh, like twelve, eight, and five. And um, I, I used to do this thing when the girls were younger. I used to do a thing called bullying school, and I'd tell them about you know when you go into school now, guys, you know people are going to say terrible things, and they're like, why would they ever say that? I was like, well, this is going to happen. People are going to say awful things, but you have to understand you have a choice here to believe them or not. And so, I, and I'd say to my eldest daughter, like you know, your hair looks terrible. Or, you look like you've just been dragged to a bush. And she's like, Dad, why would someone? So you're what? actually kind of giving them. The- I'm immunizing them. I'm immunizing them to it. And I'm like, what would your response be? And so my eldest daughter would be like, why would anyone say that to you? My my young my middle daughter is like I tell them to f off you know and I was like, oh, she's fine she's grand and so it was only only recently enough um my eldest daughter came home and she said um she noticed a girl crying in the schoolyard and she went over to her and she asked the girl you know is everything okay and the girl said no someone called her a terrible name you know it was about her weight and stuff and Hannah said to my daughter said to her but you know why do you believe them yeah. and the girl and the girl yeah and the girl said what do you mean she said, Hannah said it only hurts if you believe them do you believe them do you believe him like she's like no and she, Hannah's like we take advice off him about anything she's like no. so, <laughs> why do you believe him about this and, he, wow. and the girl and the girl said to her Hannah you'd make a great therapist and started smiling and I was like well now there is the key right we all have a choice of you know what we believe and what we don't believe and we have a ten- and that's just the way the brain is primed we have a tendency to think when we hear something negative that that's a truth and that's a fact and someone's seen something in us but in fact you know, the opposite, the opposite exists. Yeah. And we have a choice about what we believe about ourselves. And that's a, that's a very empowering moment, you know, for a child. Big time. That's an amazing, amazing empowering moment. What's the difference? Is there, are there many major differences between girls and boys, especially as teens? What, what would you see there? Yeah. Well, I suppose girls would be far more uh, into, um, would be, can be quite clicky, let's say. And, uh, you know, I've noticed that myself and boys can be a little bit more straightforward in some ways, I suppose. But um, in relation to, say, technology and that girls would be more on Instagram and more about appearance than that. it can be absolutely terrible. The amount of families I meet, beautiful families where their daughter has been like consumed by her looks and by, you know, filters and what people are saying. I mean, it's a, a, the way I look at it when I, when I think about it. I'm glad I'm not a teenage girl, let's say, or a teenage boy in today's world, because yeah. it's almost, the way I see it, sometimes when I'm going for a run, I'm thinking about it. It's, it's almost like a gladiatorial contest. You know, you're yeah. throwing yourself out there. You put an image of yourself out there. Yeah. And then you're waiting for you know people to put their thumb up or put thumb down to give you some validation. And if your dopamine is firing on, like, you know, yeah, gorgeous, you look oh, stunning, hon, and then someone says something negative, all you're going to, cons- you're going to selectively abstract that. Yeah. That's just the way the brain is primed. You're going to selectively abstract the thing where someone says you look terrible, all that awful. That's going to be the one thing that you see and feed on. And so every time you send a video out there, you're, you're looking, consuming negative stuff about yourself or looking for the, uh, that's, a, that's a very destructive thing for girls and I think you know anorexia is something I work with a lot it's a very difficult thing Shane to work with yeah. it's a yeah. very profound experience for a family to go through and it's very difficult to break it because it's a positive feedback loop you know you get it you get a buzz and get a high off not eating that's a that's a tough thing you know dopamine fires when you don't eat and you feel guilty for when you eat and so the thing that's well, tough and so and that's that's and I I hear so many Great kids, beautiful girls telling me that they think they're ugly, but they're they're down consumed, which I'm, you know, I'm 
it's it's a, it's new to me because I'm in my 40s, but they're so into like, you know, when I was a kid, I looked at myself. I didn't think like, oh, my God, my eyebrows are nice or my nose is beautiful or my eyes are good. I never I never broke myself down into that. Like, you know, you'd look at yourself and go, oh, yeah. whatever. They're absolutely looking, you know, dissecting every, like their ear, their earlobe, the, you know, the nose, the anything, the lip. They're breaking down every aspect. And it's, and it's it has to be down to social media and filters. And so that that's having a profound impact on, on, on girls and joy, like you know, for teenage girls. Without a doubt. So you, with the girls, you're saying, okay, there's kind of the social the, media, social media. Yeah. Instagram, boys, TikTok. Boys, is it gaming? It's more gaming. Yeah, it is more gaming. But again, uh, uh, bullying is, is more profound for boys nowadays because, you know, you, you, traditionally, if you got bullied, you'd be in school and someone would say, tell you, call your names or whatever it is. But now it's you're never free from it. Like as I was writing in the book, you know, cyberbullying, that you're, they're basically the bully is in the pocket of your, uh, you know, of your child there and they're walking home with them and they're in the bedroom with them. And and so yeah. you're never free from it. And to be to be socially excluded has a profound impact on us as human beings. You know, it really hurts. I mean, so, there's neuro- neuroscience behind it. Absolutely, yeah. So one of the key things that, that comes out very early on in your book is the importance of boundaries. Yeah. So w- what I'm wondering is, well, A, I suppose, maybe just for people listening to this, what does that mean to you? And B, how does that relate to what you just spoke about there for the boys and the girls? Well, boundaries are th- the most important thing we can do as parents very early on, right? Because you know, how much power do we ever have over our children? You know what I mean? When they hit 16, 17, your 17 year old son tells you, I'm not going to school or I'm not coming home. You know, you are, you know, there's a scene from the Sopranos where Tony Soprano is trying to punish his daughter and he turns around to his wife and he says, <laughs> if she ever figures out we've no power, we're screwed here. <laughs> and, and it's like, you know, and there's a mafia boss talking about that. Right. And it's like, yeah, we don't have much power as parents, but you, you get that power very early on through your boundaries and you teach your children how to regulate themselves and to critically evaluate things. That's a really important part of boundaries. And so there's, there's different types of boundaries. There's like permissive boundaries where you give in. You know, you can say, well, that's it. Now you're not going out tonight. And then later on, they're off and they're going out and you're doing all those kind of things. They're destructive or you're you're autocratic in your boundaries. You know, your child breaks a boundary and your boundary is just like a concrete wall and they hit it and it just annihilates their spirit. That's not good for a child, right? That's a terrible experience for a child. It's too anyway, soft or too hard. It's that's to get- too soft, too hard. Too hard will make them duplicitous and actually lie to you and cheat and, cheat and develop an ability to kind of be Machiavellian because they know to get caught is, you know, not good. And so they won't know why not to get caught. They just learn not to get caught. So what you need is your boundary to be fair and authoritative, right? And that's a really key thing that with the boundary, say let's say your son games and you said to him, you can, he can game for 40 minutes on Monday and you come home, he's been gaming for two hours, right? Now, one reaction could be to pull the games out and throw it in the bin. Now that's the autocratic one. Another boundary could be to say nothing about it and just like not have a fight and have your dinner and relax. That's the permissive one, right? And so your child, both of those are kind of equal outcomes, but you know, children, yeah. children do not thrive in those environments a boundary i would always say to parents is like a stabilizer on a bike you know the child b- bounces off it a little bit and the b- the stabilizer has a little bit of giving it to allow for their their movement yeah. so they're kind of calibrating themselves and so a good boundary let's say you come home and they've been gaming for two hours you say to them well tomorrow night you're not going to game now because you broke the rule and on wednesday you can game for 20 minutes and if you show me at 20 minutes on wednesday you can go back to 40 minutes on thursday now the boundary didn't annihilate them it didn't destroy them but it's teaching them how to manage themselves so next week when it comes to gaming they might they might say they might break it again but eventually they will learn how to do it they'll say you know well if i over game i don't get any game tomorrow that's crap and then i only have a tiny bit of a game on wednesday so it's better if i if i regulate myself they mightn't even use that word but if i actually if i do the rules here i get more game than if i don't do the rules right and so what you're doing is you're doing so much in those in those moments you're teaching your kid to listen to you you're teaching your kid that you're fair you're teaching your kid how to manage themselves how to think critically so when they're off when they're off in their lives and you know they're down in I don't know, Lanzarote and someone says, let's go for a swim after beer. They might say to themselves, you know what? That's actually not a good decision to go for a swim at two o'clock in the morning after drinking all night because I can die here in this situation. You're developing their ability to understand consequences for behavior. And so what any of us are trying to do, Shane, is like, you know, teach your children so that they can make the right decision when we're not around. You know, that's a really important thing that we're not going to be there all the time. And so we give them boundaries early on in their lives. Parents kind of think, modern parents kind of think to be give boundaries is a bit autocratic or a bit despotic. And, you know, the biggest mistake parents make is they want to be their child's friend. Yes. You know, I adore my kids. I love them, but I can handle when they're not happy with me. I can handle when they're like disappointed that I've brought in a rule that they have to go to bed or, you know, uh, so we have to learn to, you know, be comfortable in their discomfort when they were kind of going, oh, dad, come on, you'd be the best dad in the world. If you leave us up, can we have McDonald's tonight for dinner? You know, 
you have to get comfortable with you know not being uh, the best guy in the world and so it's a, it's a, it's really important that uh, we learn that we're not our children's best friend we're actually the people who set them up for failure or success in their lives and so if we're consistent and this is a huge mistake parents make is that and this is what my book is all about you know when you meet a partner you set out on this incredible r- journey together you don't really think I wonder what they're like, you know, when things get a bit complicated. I wonder what their early attachment to their par- their caregiver was like, you know. We, we probably should be asking. We, we should be asking the, the amount of people who say to me, because I often I often do this in couples therapy. I look at all the attachments and and their love language and their personality traits and, you know, all where they came in the family. And then we're looking at two magnets repelling each other, like, you know, going, well, this is why we've got conflict, but we can figure this out. You can absolutely be opposites or similar and you can have a healthy and thriving life, but you just have to be aware of the invisible forces driving you and so we don't think those things and so in, in parenting wise we can often have one parent who's permissive and one parent who's autocratic one's the good cop and one's the bad cop and it causes chaos you know and yes. and um, you know inconsistent both, both parents and then with the way you're describing it of course kids are so smart if there's a weakness on one side they will explain oh they'll they absolutely have an, an, an uncanny ability very young i mean you see it in two or three year olds figuring out yeah who is the person to get the stuff off and who is the person that i have to be kind of a little bit more careful around they figure that out i mean they're so adept socially speaking babies and it's, it's incredible and they, they you know and they develop that very early on and i'd often hear parents saying no oh, well she's quite manipulative i'm like well you said you know she she because she knows she can and she yeah. knows that you're, you know, there's an inconsistency between the two of you, and it's very valuable to her to be able to, you know, put pitch you against each other, and um, and so that's that's what can happen. So inconsistency is causes loads of problems. I mean, it's a, it's probably the most, you know, serious issue that children live with is the inconsistency of like you know parenting and rules and and foundations and boundaries. And so that's why boundaries is the first part of the book. Before I ever get near technology, or whatever, you yeah. have to have boundaries. And you have to be, if you have its parents, you've got to be aligned on those boundaries. Yeah. And if you're not aligned, this is the key. Because we're, you know, a lot of the time we're not aligned because we come from different environments. We 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 you know we grew up with different people and they came from different environments. It's such a complicated thing. Yeah. And so if it's not aligned, the key here is that you don't criticize each other in front of the parents. Let's just say if we're if we're in a relationship, Shane, you're telling the kids, you know, that's it, you're uh, I don't say to you in front of the kids, Shane, that's way too serious. Relax there, like you know, you're being too. You know, that's what that's what causes so much problems. You might disagree. Myself and my wife disagree often. Um, we'll do, do it in private. We'll talk about it afterwards. And my wife might say, I think you might be a bit too strict there. Or you've been a bit too lenient there or whatever. But if the kids hear it, you know, it's destructive for them. Kids yeah. crave boundaries. So what, what age? Your, your, your eldest is what age? Twelve. And your youngest? Five. I don't know who said it, but it's something along the lines of like, you know, I had all these theories about parenting before I became a parent. And when I became a parent, I threw them all out the window. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I, I find it's funny. I find the opposite. Yeah, um, yeah I find it helps me to be more practical. I, but I think I'm, I was that way anyway. Um, yeah. I'm very, I think one of my things is I'm very good at distilling down heavy theoretical concepts into very manageable and accessible. I think that's the teacher in me. And, uh, yes. you know, and so I love reading heavy articles and I, and I, and I've, and I read lots of academic things. And I often think when I'm reading it, God, that was just written purely for peer review. There's no benefit to anybody living, okay. uh, any mom or dad at home. There's no way they're going to ever understand what that was. And so that kind of is a bugbear of mine. And a lot of, a lot of books out there are written for academic approval. They're written for like someone go, wow, what an incredible academic book. I'm like, well, what value has that got to do with any person living in their life every day? And so, yeah, what I always try to do is think about what's happening in my own life in relation to the theory and then how I could give someone the theory and make it practical so that it actually helps them. And what's, what's your, what's your favorite then theory in terms of application in your own home? What would you say is your go-to? In, in relation to what area now? I don't know, just in relation to even like, say, like, you know, you're, you run a business, you're busy. Yeah, yeah you're in yeah. demand. You're, you're a writer. You're, you're running a busy clinic in Dublin. And um, probably other lots, lots of other stuff in the forest. So, you yeah. know, you can be busy in your world. Then you come back. Is there some sort of a way, for example, that, I mean, you know, I, I talk with a lot of business people who, if they bring that kind of business energy or focus into their house, things yeah, don't necessarily go, go that way. It mightn't be suitable. Well, no. I certainly, I, I would say, I certainly don't psychoanalyze my children. 
You know what I mean? I park that, you know, and I, you know, my wife would often say that to me, God, you know, you're pretty good at not like, you know, analyzing the kids. I'm like, well, no, I'm their parent now. That's my profession. But of course, a bit of it creeps in. What I'm always listening out to is how they speak to each other and how they speak to themselves. That's a key thing. You know, I'd often ask them questions about how they're interpreting things. That's just, and that's not psychoanalyzing. It's to hear their self-talk, you know, how they're talking to themselves. And so my eldest daughter is dyslexic and I'm, a, I'm an ambassador for Dyslexia Ireland and and so I was I've helped her with that so there's no stigma whatsoever in her head about being dyslexic and it's a joke in the family now and so there's a bit of levity around it and you know so that's uh, that's probably my go-to is like the idea of reauthoring which is a is a, is a thing of narrative therapy the ability to reauthor your life to, to think about your life and I, I don't lay it's very hard at times and it's something that I've seen myself so destructive for. You, know, you don't talk about people on TV you know you don't make comments this is where I see the seeds of anorexia uh, moms or dads talking about someone on TV and going God doesn't she look whatever it is and the kids sitting there internalizing that God if she's not very attractive mom and dad are going to be kind of judgmental about it and so I better look a certain way or I got to be judged and so you have to be very careful about what you say around your children because they're consuming it all the time well a couple of things on that then so you mentioned the labeling side of it yeah I mean, society is seems to be labeling everything you know in terms of I've got this issue or this disorder and while that might yeah. be the case, there's obviously I mean, there, there must be some some concerns around that. What's your view on labelling? Well, see, labelling, I've got two kind of views. Well, labelling and the way the system is set up opens up services for people. There's no doubt about it. You get a label of, uh, you know, ASD or autism or, you know, whatever the label is might be. That's a very important thing for families because that will open up services and that'll be a very sought after thing for families to get access to services because services in this country are not good at all for mental health and um you know and, and there's too much waiting lips and so you have to you ha- do have to get a label the labels i'm talking about are the labels that are really destructive you know the ones that are you know people self-limiting labels teachers tell you you know shane you're not as bright as your brother or you know you're not you're not it's not dyslexia i had, I, I had someone tell me that recently the teacher said to them it's not dyslexia that's pure stupidity and you're kind of going no, that's 2022 like no, that sounds like something that they said what they said it's not dyslexia that's- it's not dyslexia because he, he misspelled a word and he's and the, and the teacher said, what the hell are you doing? He goes, well, sir, I'm dyslexic. And the teacher said, that's not dyslexic. That's pure stupidity. Right. And I was like, right, there's a, there's a label there now, you know, and labels don't predict the, the labels don't predict the future. They write them. Right. Yes. So when we, we say all the research would show you that. And so they are the labels I'm talking about. They're self, you know, those self limiting self, you know, restricting, yes. you know, things that stop you from thriving because we, 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 the way the brain is designed, it's going to feed off those things and then it's going to act them out. And so, Labels in relation to accessing service, very important because of the way the structure of the system. I mean, that's just the game. That's the system that we're in. Labels that we tell ourselves about who we are, very destructive. And we have to always work our way around those things. Okay. Okay. And so the, and so the second you said earlier on in relation to um, your daughter with this dyslexia, yeah. you're, you're talking about, and I see this a lot, actually. I see, I see this a little bit even in my own house. And I, see, I certainly hear it from clients is where kids are very hard on themselves. Oh, terribly hard on themselves. Because, um, but that's just the way the brain is is designed, you see, where we, we it's like cognitive distortions. I could tell you that's fantastic. You're brilliant. You're this, you're that. And then I could say one negative thing to you. And then you're just going to selectively abstract that out and consume that. And kids do that. Oh, can, I give you, can I give you just a specific example? Go on, yeah. Curious to see what you might say. So let's just say you've got a you've got a, a dad and he's you know himself and his son love soccer. The son is, I don't know, say 14, 15, and can't enjoy the soccer because every time he plays, he has a crisis of confidence, he's really hard on himself. And no matter what the dad says, or even the coach has said, the guy's just killing himself after each match. Right. That's okay. Yeah. So there, I mean, and I would say the more you reassure him that that dad, the more you reassure him, the more you're going to cause problems for the child there. Right. And so that's often what happens there. And I'd yeah. say there's there's a little fear in there that the child isn't living up to, to standard. He's got that child has got an internalized standard. Right. That is just un unmeetable, unmeetable. Let's say, or he he's not going to be able to reach, and so he's he's stealing all his joy there. I get in there and I'd ask him some questions about, you know, well, first of all, is it is it to the dad? Did the dad was the dad good at football? Does he believe that he's not as good as his dad? Does he try, does he want the dad to kind of has he played a good game ever? You know, and has the dad ever seen a good game? And what's that like? I get in there and I'd really look at it like, you know, well, what is the thought process? And you know, this child, he's really not enjoying football. Why the hell is he playing it? And you know, he loves it obviously. And so what's the standard that he has in his head that he's trying to meet here? And is it is it in relation to showing showing it proving something to his dad? Um is it perfectionism? 
I mean, is it the idea of he's perfectionist, which is a very cruel thing? I mean, you're never going to be happy there. And so is, is that in there? Um, yeah, so I, I I need to really sit down with him and ask him sure. a couple of questions about, you know, what's he experiencing there and, you know, who, who what does a good game look like? I mean, if you ask if you ask that child that question, what what what's enough there? I mean, what, what's a good game look like? Um, and I'd say you'd hear a massive silence because he's probably chasing a shadow there. There's there's nothing there that's going to be a good game so for him. That's so a great so, question, though. What does a good game look like? Yeah, what does a good game look like there for yeah. you? How would you know? This is a question that I always ask someone like that. How would you know you played a good game? Yeah. What would that how what would that look like? And yeah. what what would people what would people say to you to let you know that that is a good game? And what do people say to you to make you know that this is where you really feel it? What do people say to you to make you feel like you haven't had a good game, but they're pretending you had a good game? And then you hear all the reassurance. You know, you'll hear all that reassurance chat. And so when you say reassurance, you're thinking you're giving them reassurance. You're feeding into their idea that you, it wasn't a good game. So you have to be, yeah. you know, just qu- questions there will really help uh, that child out very of that. Good. Yeah, yeah. Very, good. very good. That's interesting. W- w- with regards to your own, do- your own uh, daughter there, but the dyslexia, what was your approach there in terms of helping her reframe that? Well, I struggled with dyslexia as a kid myself. So I understood it very, very yeah. well. And um my whole drive was i i knew what it did to me internally uh, at a very young age i was very good at english very good at writing uh, and then very bad at writing in some ways and i i used to do all my homework on a typewriter this back in the 80s and the teachers would say to me you have to handwrite it and i'm like well you know <laughs> it doesn't come out as well when i handwrite this thing you know <laughs> and so the typewriting essays would be very good and the hand the handwritten stuff was like i was muted by the pen but then allowed wow, to yeah. soar through my typewriter and this was one of those typewriters and then when i got a laptop in college it was just like you know it was game over i was just like okay i can I, i've now learned to sing here you know okay. um and so what I did with her very early on was make sure that I always call it a dyslexic voice. I got in there and disrupted that voice and I didn't allow it to speak to her negatively because it did to me. It absolutely did to me. And it yeah. said things like, you know, you're not as bright as I grew up in a very academic family. My two brothers ahead of me were very academic and I struggled with like spelling. You know, I wasn't very dyslexic, I was mild dyslexia. But um, what did you say to her, uh, Richard, to disrupt her voice? Made a joke out of it. I just constantly made humor jokes about it. And so on. And then she'd say, like, my, my middle daughter would say, Dad, how do you spell tomorrow? Whatever. And Hannah would shout down, don't ask him, he's dyslexic. You know, <laughs> right? And so it would be a joke, you know. And then I, and I'd also bring in things. So she loves the Beatles. And I'd say, you know, John Lennon was dyslexic. And I'd sit down and I'd show her the words of I am the walrus. And I'd say, do you think anyone who wasn't dyslexic could come up with this stuff? I am you as you or me. <laughs> Similina Pilchard climbing up the Eiffel Tower. I said, that stuff is the, that's the gift of dyslexia. That's the bending of language. You know, and I showed I showed some W. B. H. poems. I was like, "Look at this guy! Look yeah. at this! Look at what he says here!" You know, that is no country for old men. The young in one another's arms, the birds in the trees, fish, flesh, and fire. Like, there's a dyslexic guy there. Now, that's one of the greatest poems that was ever written. Now, you tell me that it's about language. You tell me that this is an issue with language. It's not an issue with language. We yeah. don't know what it is, but it's not. It doesn't mean you're stupid. There's a gift in it too. It's frustrating, definitely frustrating and annoying to me at times because people always think, oh, get Richard to write it on the board or whatever because, you know, you're, you're perceived a certain way. I'm like, oh, I don't think I want to do that. I can write it on my laptop for you, no problem. But there's a little thing there where I kind of go, no, I don't think I'll do that. But um, and, that, and that's the frustration part of it, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. But you you, you got to get in there and make levity, joke. I disrupted it, messed with her. I mean, if you talked to her, you wouldn't hear any negative ideas around dyslexia. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Yeah, you probably know this already, but actually, most of the say, even in the business world, many people I've met who are very successful who are dyslexic. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. Oh, I meet it all the time in the clinic, and it's almost, I always find it's almost like coming out, you know. I had yeah. a doctor, <laughs> doctor there recently tell me, like, you know, that he was, he was retiring, and he said, I just, I just want to say it to someone, I'm dyslexic. You know, he said, I, I see you're an ambassador for dyslexia. So I just want to say it to someone, I'm dyslexic because I've been writing these notes, for, you know, <laughs> and I've been terrified someone's going to find out I can't spell a feckin' word, you know. But, um, and both that's my, both my kids are dyslexic, but I've often joked with Judy is that I, because of my work in terms of working, business yeah. and everything else, but I wish I kind of was dyslexic. Because it almost, it almost seems like you're guaranteed to succeed. You know? Well, it dri- it's a driver. It was a driver for me. I mean, it was an absolute driver for me. And um, it, <laughs> what I found funny about it was that uh, I could spell really complicated words and not so good with the, the easier oh, wow. words. Yeah, I mean, it affects everybody else differently. And I went through the whole education system until about fifth class. Um, my parents had an idea that I wasn't reading as fast as my brothers. But it wasn't until I met one really great teacher who said, look, my brother was dyslexic too. And that's what Richard has there. And, we, and I went off and got a test on and all that. And that's the kind of... Um, that's the kind of thing about meeting someone who was good. It changed my mind about, you know, I thought I was stupid for a while. And that was definitely that voice, you know. 
Yeah. And that's the key thing, I think, is getting in there and understanding. Who was that person that caught that? Bridget O'Grady. I wrote, actually wrote an article about her. It was an incredible moment because I, I thought for years, you know, and I, I was working in universities and I didn't talk about being dyslexic because I held it like a, a secret, you know what I mean? I could see kids who were around me and I'd give them great ideas around how not, how not to think about yourself negatively, but I never would tell them. And um, I wrote, I said one day I was just in my clinic and I was writing, in our, I was writing one of my columns for the Irish Examiner. I talked about, you know, out of all the things I meet in my clinic, dyslexia is probably the most profound one in a lot of ways because it brings a lot up for me. And I talked about this, my own experience growing up with dyslexia. And I mentioned her and I said it wasn't until I met my fifth class teacher, Bridget O'Grady, that, you know, changed my in, my internal talk, talk about myself. Wow. And the next morning I was sitting in my clinic during lunch. I had two hours off and I was sitting down and my phone pinged, you know, my emails went off and it was Bridget O'Grady. And she said oh, to really? me, um, yeah, it was brilliant. I mean, but I was bawling, crying. She said to me, you know, um, Richard, I remember you well. You were a beautiful little boy. Now those lines just uh, yeah. got me in the old rag and bone shop of the heart, you know, because yeah. I didn't think I was a beautiful boy. You know, I thought I had something terrible to hide and that I wasn't bright and I wasn't I played though for, for, for sharing it because I always think that those kind of people who perhaps help without realizing how much they're helping, they need to be saluted. Like, you yeah. know, that was amazing. Yeah, well yeah thanks. And it was a, it was a big moment, but it was a it was a cathartic moment for me too, where I went a bit like that. Like, I mean, I had, I had, you know, I came first in my class in university and got like, you know, this and that and won awards in school. And I, I was, you know, I was academic and I was bright and all that. I got a full scholar, full bright scholarship to America. You know? So all the evidence was that I'm not stupid, right? Yeah, you know, still- and I booked, but but still, there's a there's that little thing in there, you know, that you kind of think maybe somehow, you know, you might still be that. And so when when I wrote that article, I kind of like just took the valve off that pressure and said, you know what, I'm not hiding anything about myself anymore. You know, this is a part of me, and you know that's that's fine, and I can live with it. Okay, yeah, that's amazing. How do you um, you know, come coming out and, and looking at you as a as a as a business owner, a parent, and a yeah. You're busy. What what's your approach to your own well being and looking after yourself? How do you switch off? How do you relax? What? Yeah, that's 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 a very good question. Um, <laughs> that's a really good one. Um, I suppose for me, the most important thing with my now, and I, I have I wasn't good at it for about two years there because I was just like overwhelmed with busyness. And really? you know yourself when you're building a business. Yes, you know it's consuming. Oh. You can't do it half heartedly. You can't put your foot into the water and kind of think about something else. You have to really put your energy into it. So, you know, I worked very hard to build the, the business up and also make sure that people that were working there were good. And, you know, it, it, you know, you have to, and you're, you're, it's a job where you're, it, there's a great meaning and fulfillment in it, but you want to make sure that you're, and you're meeting people at the most vulnerable. So you want to make sure that the service you're providing is absolutely, you know, you want to make sure you want to make sure it's it's a very good service, and there's a lot of services that aren't very good out there, and there's a lot of people out there in any profession that aren't very good, and it's not very regulated, and so that's what I'm trying to say there. And that I, I was consumed with that a bit, and I maybe at the start too consumed with it, where I didn't, cons- you know, I was more into I was I was too consumed with the business, so it, it took me a while to kind of figure this out, and I pulled back a little bit and all that. But for for my own mental health, what I, I what I find the most important is running and going for a swim okay and you, are you one of these seawater swimmers yeah i am cold I water am. swimmer in the morning yeah you know, not every morning now not in november so much okay. but uh, <laughs> i was going to go for some yesterday but my wife said you're getting pneumonia you're too old but uh, <laughs> but um yeah so yeah so that's like uh, and really for me a huge part of my mental health like that there, there are things i can do actively that i can do and i can go and go for a run that's a massive thing for me coming I mean, going out for a run having a shower i feel great after that I loved running all my life. I love running and I love swimming. Yeah. Um, that's your way. Re- that's my way of switching off. But really how I actually feel good about myself and feel grounded has been with the family. Yeah. And just being with the kids watching, you know, I am a celebrity. Get me out of here. They're out, they love that. So we sit down together and that's where I, I feel most like Zen. If that's a, if that's the right thing, I feel most connected to my family, my wife and three kids are there. We're watching this together. We're having something nice to eat, you know, and we're just all together and just chatting about things and, you know, just talking about life and whatever it is. And that's where I kind of feel like that's for me is my mental health. That's my well being. going out, drinking, all that stuff. No, that's not me at all anymore. That, that was me in my twenties, but no, I have no interest in that ever. You know, that's not kind of, I go out the odd time. I'm not a complete bore, but I like to be at home by seven o'clock, eight o'clock, yeah, yeah. you know, and um, so I can relate to that, Richard. Yeah. That. On the last page of your book, and this is probably going to lead us into the the last part of this uh, conversation, which has been brilliant. So thanks again for the time. No problem. You've written, you've got 
parenting is not always about getting it right. It's by far the most challenging journey we go on as adults, which I can resonate with for sure. Yeah. What I'm wondering is with you, you know, clearly you do a lot of things right and you help a lot of people, but I'm just curious for yourself, where do you think you can do better as a parent for yourself? I know I can always do better as a parent, right? Um, a big fear I had going into parenting was that I'd be like my dad. He had a very bad temper, very bad, you know, alcoholism, addiction. Um, I certainly drank a lot when I was in my early 20s and I worried, I worried, you know, I mean, college students, like, you know, the def those thoughts were definitely in there. You don't want to bring this into your life. And so I, I, I really cut that out going into my parenting life. But um, I suppose what I often think sometimes about parenting is that, you know, when you're when you're older and the kids are gone, what you wouldn't give for those moments where you said, you know, the kids shut down. Can you read a story? Like, no, I'm too busy. No, I'm just got a bit of work to do. I often think, you know, those moments you, you'd give your left arm to kind of go, can I go back into that moment? And go, yeah, yeah and be straight up the stairs. But it's not yeah. easy when you're tired and you're yeah. hungry and you've had a hard day. Yeah. And so what I try to be is more aware of that stuff. I'm not always aware of it. And I yeah. sometimes I'll say, look, I can't tonight, guys. I've got too much on. I will, and I can hear myself, but I'm aware of it. So it happens less. Yes. So I try to be more aware of those moments and think, you know, this is the key thing that I always think. Everything, because we can live by this almost George and Lenny from the uh, from of Mice and Men idea that one day I'll get the jack together and live off the fat of the land. You know, one like Bruce Princeton would say, one day, baby, we'll walk in the sun, you know. But until then, you know, tramps like us were born to run. You know, one day we'll walk in the sun. I'm like, I'm walking in the sun right now here. Yeah. The kids are, the kids are, as you know, are healthy. Uh, we have enough food to eat. Uh, we have a warm house. Um, it doesn't have to be a feckin' mansion. It doesn't have to be the most, you know, the biggest thing in the world or the, I don't have to have this much money in my bank account. It's not about all that stuff. That is actually a, a futile endeavor and it's an empty endeavor. And the more you get connected with that, because I have a charity working in the Philippines with the Bajo tribe and I, I work with these, uh, uh, keeping them in education. And a couple of years ago, the three members of the tribe came and lived with myself and my family here in, in, in Dublin. Yeah, it's an incredible experience. What's the charity called? Embrace uh, Bajo. Embrace Bajo, spell Bajo. Yeah. B A D J A O. J A O, okay. Yeah. And every year I bring over groups over to work in the schools that we've built over there. It's an incredible experience, Shane. It's it's it's, it's just actually life changing stuff. You go and you work with the Bajo and they're the most wonderful, funny, connected people. Connected is the word, you know, they have no word for suicide in their dialect and all their houses are connected to each other. They're all kind of like related. They live above the shoreline and they're just all so connected. And I suppose that's what I'm always kind of that. that and I, and I, my, my daughters now are really good friends with them and they would talk to them by, by Facebook Messenger most Saturday mornings. And it's in my mind all the time, you know, that stay connected. Don't get disconnected. Don't be get, don't get consumed by, you know, by, materialism don't get consumed by things that are like fake and leave you absolutely you know at 47.2 realizing that you know when you did get that you did get that promotion you did get that money that wasn't exactly what i was searching for actually what i needed was right in front of me but i missed it because i thought that was the thing that would get me to be in the sun someday and that's that's just about awareness that's just about being more aware about yourself and all the trappings because we're we are primed for social competition. So I can look at you and think, oh, that house is bigger than my house. And you look at me, go, his car is nice than my car. We're primed for that stuff that steals our joy. Comparison is a thief of joy. And so as a parent, I just try to be a little bit more present. Not always. I don't get it right always. And some mornings I wake up and think, oh shit, you know, I missed it last night. I wasn't there. I was yeah. I was annoyed. I was cranky. I was tired. I was writing, whatever it was. And so then tonight I'm going to be different and I'll be more present. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the that's the kind of that it's not the game of perfect, you know, the putting game, you know, the what's his name, yeah. Bob Rotella's book on putting. Uh, putting is not a, uh, golf is not a game of perfect. Parenting isn't a game of perfect. But if we min if we're if we're more aware, we minimize the errors. Yes, there's a lot there. I could probably talk to you for another hour, but but to, to respect you and to kind of finish sure. it up. Sure, but just the I think I love that what you said about staying connected and avoiding being disconnected. Yeah. Your, your book in early 23 is The Home is Where the Smart is. Brilliant title. So congratulations. Who's that published with? Um I was going to say Folans for some reason. A penguin. Penguin. <laughs> penguin very annoyed if you did that. Penguin, I said Folans. We'll make sure I put a link in and I'll update the link. Do yeah, the home is where the start is. Yeah. It's coming out late spring. Okay, brilliant. Listen, thanks so much. Thanks a million, Shane. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed um, listening to that. I certainly got a lot out of it myself. Um, I think that's one of the reasons I was curious about talking to Richard uh, because he has a lot of, a huge amount of experience. I think a couple of things that stood out to me, and there was a lot, and I'm going to go back and listen to this a couple of times myself as a parent. Um, 
I, I was really taken with his explanation around what he saw as the cause of anxiety in teens and adolescents. And, you know, parents protecting their kids too much, removing the obstacles, removing the pain. And that phrase that he said that one of the kids said, like, you know, I never had to manage anything in my life. Um, very powerful. Just the pain and adversity is a great teacher if we let it do its work. Um, a lot in that. I think uh, something else that stuck out to me was the, the, the source of real power in boundaries for parents, setting boundaries. Uh, making sure they're clear, being fair, but being firm. I loved the question that he asked about uh, to one of his clients, like, what's it like to be in your parents' relationship? He asked one of the, the teens, what's it like to be in your parents' relationship? What a great question. That's a very sobering question as a parent. Think, okay, well, what's it like to be in our relationship? <laughs> really great question. And I was very taken with uh, his insight around, you know, you're, you're, that you're trying to teach your kids ultimately that they can make the right decision when you're not there, that they're able to stand on their own two feet and have their own process for an inner process for making decisions, making the right decisions. And I think linked to that then was that the importance of being consistent as a parent, not always the easiest thing at all. And I'd certainly recommend Richard's book again, Parenting the Screenager. I think, uh, and one of the things he says in that is that like it's not easy being a parent in today's world, and it's not. And it's not e easy being a teen in today's world. But um, I think with more people like Richard out there, uh, it, it'll help us all navigate more effectively through a tricky time. And there's plenty of solutions out there. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. That is it for this week. Ciao for now. Bye-bye.